My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. My guest is Michael Shermer, founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and executive director of the Skeptic Society. His new book, The Mind of the Market, brings together economics and evolutionary biology. Michael, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Thanks for having me. This fellow homo economicus, could you describe who that is and what he's like? <laughs> right. Well, this is sort of a classic classic myth that I've been busting uh, in this book, uh, you know, like I traditionally do for at Skeptic Magazine, what, what we do is bust myths, and the myth here is that um, economic man is rational, free, and selfish. That is, uh, it's the assumption by economists for two centuries that uh, when we make make decisions and behaviors in, in our lives, that they're rational choices, that we're, although influenced by culture or whatever, we're still free to make those rational choices, and that when we make free and rational choices, that we're always maximizing our utility or our value, or you know, we're sort of selfishly doing things to maximize our own benefit. That that's the assumption. And the model, <laughs> which is you know sort of composed mathematically by by a mathematically minded economist, uh, doesn't really pass muster when you actually run subjects through experiments or measure what people do out in the real world. I find that they're free, rational, or selfish. No, uh, well, there's lots of contradictions. Of course, that works as a first approximation under certain circumstances, but there's so many exceptions that obviously there has to be some other rules applied. Uh, for example, the last couple of Nobel Prizes given in economics have been given to experimental psychologists, not economists. In fact, the first two, well, the first one given to Daniel Kahneman and should have been given to his colleague, uh, Amos Tversky, who founded this whole field of behavioral economics, but Amos died can't give the Nobel Prize uh, posthumously, so uh, Kahneman got it. But neither Tversky nor Kahneman ever had a single course in economics. They were experimental psychologists, yet here they are winning a Nobel Prize in economics. What's going on? Well, it's a recognition by the field that there's been a major transition, and that is that people don't always make rational choices. For example, like say you walk into a store and there's an iPod on sale for 100 bucks, and he says, hey, you know, down the street, the other store that sells Apple stuff has it on sale for um, 50 bucks. Half off, wow, you know, would you make the walk? Sure, of course, everybody says, yeah, do it. So you're in the same store, and you're buying a $1,000 flat-screen TV and says, hey, you know, that store down the street, floor box down the street, has it on sale for $950. Would you make the walk? Most people say, nah, it's only 50 bucks. Well, wait, it's the same $50. Relative to $1,000 versus $100, $50 changes in its value. So that tells us, these are called framing effects, that tells us that the frame of reference that we compare things to alters how we view the value. So, for example, when you ask people how much money they make and how much more they would like to make to feel satisfied, they'll always give a higher number. And this is called the hedonic treadmill. No matter how much you're making, 100,000, you want to make 150. If you make 150, you want to make two. You make two, you want to make 250. Is also framed by what people around you are making. So not only is it relative to what you're making and you always want more, it's also relative to what other people around you are making. So you're less likely to want more if you're the highest paid person in the company versus in the middle of the rank. So that, again, tells us that it's not really rational. It's kind of emotionally driven based on our perceived value of the frame around us, what's relative, what we're comparing it to. And uh, so those kind of simplistic old wives' tales about you know keeping up with the Joneses, well, there's actually <laughs> quantifiable data there to support that. Actual people, as opposed to Homo economicus, makes they, they make comparisons to other things that Homo economicus is not meant to take into account. That's right. In a classic experiment called the ultimatum game, two subjects uh, in the room there, and you give one of them a hundred dollars. Just picture these as poor, starving students, and a hundred bucks—that's pretty good. You give the hundred dollars to one, and you say, "Okay, you you need to make an offer now to the other person in the room with you. There, a stranger." of some split, uh, whatever you think is the right split you'd like to offer, 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20, 90, 10, whatever you think you'd like to offer. If that other person accepts your offer, you both get to keep the money. If he rejects your offer, neither of you get any money at all. So, okay, these are poor, starving students. They're motivated. They could use the dough. So, now, according to homo economicus theory, that person should offer something like a 90-10 split. 
maximize his utility. I'm going to keep as much of this money as I can for my own selfish benefit. My rational calculation says he'll accept that offer because he's just walked in the lab with nothing, and he can walk out of here right now with 10 bucks. Nobody's going to turn down a free 10 bucks, are they? Well, in fact, almost all subjects turn down the free 10 bucks. And when you ask them why, they say, because it's not fair. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and fair. that bastard's not going to get away with such an unfair offer. So from an economist's point of view, you would, you would phrase that as, he's willing to pay $10 to punish somebody for injustice. Now, that's not rational, except in the context of evolutionary economics, where if we consider our evolution as a social primate species in small hunter-gatherer bands where the reasonably equitable redistribution of food products and tools and things like that in a resource-poor environment was critical to survival. Anybody who's really making lopsided offers, keeping uh, an extra hoard of, you know, hoarding an extra share of food and so on, is going to be severely punished because it hurts the group as well as the other individuals. So we've evolved this emotional, deep emotional sense of justice and right and wrong and what's fair and unfair. And that may not be rational, but except in the context of our evolutionary history, it makes more sense. So we make choices as if we were still traveling, traveling around in small bands, foraging for survival every single day then. Yes. I to think of it as like this. Yes, of course, our brains are pliable and flexible, and we learn a lot. We have a big cortex, and we're influenced by our parents and siblings and peer groups and our culture. All that's true, of course. But 99.9% .9 of our... History has been spent in this hunter-gatherer stage, the Paleolithic environment. Um, the modern world that we live in is, you know, like 0.01% of human history. It's nothing. So surely that past has had some influence. And it's only in the last decade to 15 years that it's been okay to study human behavior from an evolutionary perspective and ask, what difference did that long uh, millennia make on how we are today? And that itself is sort of an odd commentary on our culture that Darwin started this whole thing 150 years ago, and it was really completely unacceptable to study human behavior from that evolutionary perspective until the 90s. Why? Well, first of all, social Darwinism read Darwin and treated evolution as a nothing but selfish, brutish, cutthroat, competitive, greed is good, nasty <laughs> sort of uh, theory, and that that led to, like, justification of colonialism, World War I, uh, brutal uh, sort of survival of the fittest of nations, Nazi uh, elimination of races that are unfit, and, you know, all that stuff. So there's, you know, was a backlash against that. And so it really wasn't until we kind of got over all that that it became acceptable to look at that. And the misperceptions of evolution, that, that it really is the survival of the fittest, how did that come about? How did people start... How, how did people start misreading what Darwin said in that way? Well, it, it happened historically for a couple of reasons. One, theory was developed in England, which is a you know more which was more of a laissez-faire, free market, competitive environment. Versus in Russia, Darwin's theory sort of trickled its way over across Europe and into Russia. The perception there was, oh well, this really justifies more socialistic kind of later it did. And like P Peter Kropotkin, who was the great anarchist revolutionist against the czars, he liked. Uh, Darwinism. He thought, yes, in fact, he had done quite a few natural history studies, and he said, when, when you go out into the environment of the great hinterlands of, of Russia, what you see are a lot of social animals being very cooperative. He wrote a book called Mutual Aid, and this is what he saw, and he documented hundreds of cases in this book, animals all the way up to human groups, where, for the most part, yes, of course, there's all that competition and predator-prey and two males going at it over some female, all that stuff that we see on the fin fur and feather shows on the nature <laughs> channel. All that's true, but, you know, when you see that, by the way, parenthetically, when you see the making of those nature shows, you know, most of the time the guy's sitting there in the camouflage blind with his camera waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing ever happens uh, that's really dramatic, and then finally you get your 30-second shot of the nastiness. Well, well, finally a fight. Yeah, so, um, but... But Kropotkin was, you know, Russian and an anarchist and was not well-received. And Huxley, uh, Darwin's bulldog, and Herbert Spencer, who coined the phrase survival of the fittest, they kind of won that cultural battle. And it was picked up by capitalists, on one hand, who said, yes, see, this justifies competitive, brutal throat capitalism. And it was picked up by mongers that said, see, survival of the fittest nations justifies war. 
all those who saw a different view of evolution simply just didn't have a voice. And particularly after World War II and the whole business about how the Nazis uh, used Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel was kind of the German version of Huxley, kind of Darwin's bulldog in Germany. And he had this whole picture of, um, you know, nations competing, survival of the fittest. And that led to the Holocaust. So naturally in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, nobody wanted anything to do with applying evolutionary theory and social Darwinism to humans because that just smacked of racism and bigotry and Holocaust and genocide. And so when Ed Wilson published his great book, Sociobiology, in 1976, he was creamed by the, by the Academy. I mean, just lambasted. And, uh, but he, in the long run, won that battle because the data is there. We are heavily influenced by our evolutionary past. And we just have to get over that misreading. In the mind of the market, I have this whole chapter on Enron and Google. And I talk about Jeffrey Skilling, the CEO of Enron. And he said his favorite book in Harvard Business School was Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. Assigned in business school, that book. Yeah, I know. It's too funny. It's like, okay, this is it. This is how we have to drive our corporations into this competitive frenzy. And he set up it at Enron. He set up this incredible system called the Rank and Yank. Rank and Yank is you, uh, all employees at Enron had to be ranked on a scale of one to five. Every six months, ten to twenty percent uh, had to be ranked as a five, and fives were fired. Wow, you talk oh. about a lack of teamwork. And you're setting up an environment that makes people selfish, nasty, brutish, and cutthroat. And there's your war of all against all. Yeah, I mean, you set it up that way. Well, we do have a dark side to our human nature. We're tribal and xenophobic and so on. Yes, you can tap into that. And so he did, <laughs> and look what happened. Uh, now, most companies, of course, are not run that way. If they were, they'd all go the way of Enron. They'd implode, and you just can't have that. So Google, by contrast, has all this team effort, and they... Um, they have free food for everybody, lots of free time. You don't punch a clock. 20% of your time can be spent doing anything you want, developing new ideas, have fun. They have volleyball courts and foosball games and pool and swimming pools. You can get a massage, get your car washed. I mean, it's, it's like a college campus there, and it, and it fuels this sense of teamwork and cooperation, and I want to give and give and give back to the company because they've given me so much. It sets up that reciprocity system and that's our dual nature, and the goal of society, of course, is how to structure it such that we attenuate the bad stuff and uh, accentuate the good stuff. Any environment, then, can be constructed where it brings out the most awful or best characteristics of a human. It depends on the environment, then. Yeah, it does. So, you know, I guess this 10,000-year experiment of civilization has been to try out different environments. And the way, my book is also prescriptive. That is, I'm suggesting there's an actual data to show that a liberal democracy and a free market economy are the you know, sort of combined best systems for, for doing that. In a liberal democracy, I mean, you, if you just think about it for a minute, of course that makes sense. You're, you're setting up a system of checks and balances so nobody gets too much power. There's a lot of transparency. At least in theory, there's supposed to be a lot of transparency, and that's the people are trusting that the system is working. There's a rule of law, protection of private property, a justice system that's supposed to be fair to all people, no matter who you are. And, uh, you know, an infrastructure that's reliable, roads that are kept maintained, bridges that don't collapse, a, a, a telecommunication system that works, you pick up the phone and there's a dial tone. I mean, there's a lot of third world countries where you don't get a dial tone. Uh, you know, a banking system that people don't feel like they have to put their money in the mattress, you know, they can actually put it in the bank and know it's going to be there. And the key here is trust. With trust, then you can have trade free trade between strangers. Otherwise, strangers between groups would not trust each other. That's back to our old tribalism. You talked about misconceptions about evolution. What about misconceptions about free markets and capitalism? There's a couple I, I demolished. The first is that, that uh, Gordon Gecko greed is good myth, that you know that's the way capitalism is. A lot of people think that, especially academics, because they never actually worked in the real world, and they think, oh, I see, that's, you know, I saw the movie, that's the, way, <laughs> that's the way Wall Street works. Well, no, it doesn't. I mean, if it did... They could, you know, if, if there weren't strict rules, that's why we have all those rules. But Academics are really going around believing Oliver Stone movies and the way they yeah. do Oh, boy. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, believe me, uh, there's a, a very strong liberal bias in the academy, no question about it, and that's been documented fairly thoroughly. I mean, I, I was in the academy for 20 years. You know, that's okay. I mean, there's, there's a ways to balance that. Anyway, that's one of the myths. Another one is that Adam Smith was, you know, blatantly pro-business. He wasn't. He didn't trust businessmen any more than he trusted government bureaucrats. He, you know, he had this famous statement about how uh, even when businessmen get together for merriment and drink, uh, 
It isn't long before the talk turns to uh, conspiring against the public to fix prices and so on. Well, one of the ways they were able to do that in a mercantilist economy was to uh, get special favors from the government for protection against their competitors, especially foreign competitors. And Smith was blatantly against this, what, what Ralph Nader calls welfare. Uh, you can't give corporations these little handouts and favors and protectionisms and then pretend you have a, a free market economy. That's not free market. And so Smith was very critical of that. And he had this whole um, diatribe about Scottish wine growers versus French wine growers. And the consumers in the United Kingdom much preferred French wine grown in the southern, warm, sunny regions of France, and the wine was great, the prices were cheap, and the Scottish wine growers up there where it's rainy and cold and wet and cloudy all the time, uh, you know, their, their wine didn't taste as good and it costs more. Well, what are you going to prefer to buy? Of course, as a consumer, you'd prefer to buy the French wine, but in mercantilism, it's still tribalism. It's still, we need to protect our producers against those evil French tribal producer, wine producers, and said, no, actually, the wealth of a nation is in all of the people and all the stuff they have. And the wealth is not in the handful of producers. It's in all those consumers. And we need a consumer-driven economy. Let the consumers decide what they want. That didn't go over well right away. It took a long time for people to grasp that. And we still practice forms of mercantilism. For Mr. Laissez-Faire, Reagan, Ronald Reagan bailed out the Harley-Davidson Company in 1984. Exactly. Now, that's, that's folk economics showing up in today's world. And it still does, right? Oh, boy, you, sure, you hear it in the current politicians. I mean, Mitt Romney's up there in Michigan saying, I will protect all American automobile workers' jobs. But protect them against what? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, what, 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 let's at least deconstruct that for a second. You mean Americans prefer foreign automobiles because they're of a higher quality and a cheaper price. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, that, that will increase the wealth of Americans. But no, he wants to protect the producers. American producers, so uh, 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 the thousands of automobile manufacturers versus the hundreds of millions of American consumers, who is he going to represent? Well, of course, we know how politics works. You know, you talk to the group, you tell the group that you're talking to what they want to hear, but really, we still do practice that, that form of protectionism, and we have to be tariffs and taxes against foreign goods. Why? What's wrong with buying Japanese or Chinese? Or I mean, if there is something wrong, there's lead in the Chinese toys or whatever, well, okay, then we won't buy them. Let's Free press will hopefully tell us about those things. We don't need a government to to, to uh, regulate that through taxes and tariffs. We can decide what we want. A protection of American auto workers is really a protection of Americans from cheaper, better cars. Then, yep, that's right. Uh, it's something that I guess we all need protection from. <laughs> I don't. Know. Well, I don't know. I mean, it gets a little mixed. Like I live in. Well, you know, we're in. You're in Southern California. Me too. And there's as long as I've lived here, I'm 53 years old. There's been. Uh, you know, Mexicans coming across the border, they come up here. I'm in Pasadena. You know, you see, you see them every morning down at the uh, Home Depot looking for work. And, you know, I hire them periodically to do this, that, and the other, you know, clean the yard or weed whack my mountainside, whatever. And they do a great job. And, you know, high-quality work at a reasonable price, and the money, I guess, goes back to their families. You know, it seems like an all-American concept, but, you know, there's this idea that somehow they're taking Americans' jobs. Not really, because there aren't any Americans lining up to do the work, and Somehow we have to protect our culture against them. Well, okay, if you give them free social services that the rest of us pay for, yeah, okay, but they shouldn't be getting that. <laughs> In fact, nobody should get social services <laughs> that they don't pay for. And it, look, if there was no work here, they wouldn't come here. They come here because there's work. That's why. So there's a market for it. So let the market decide that. The whole immigration debate going on today, then, is is a vestige of the in-group, out-group mentality of the, the days and tribes. I think so, and uh, it beats me why it suddenly came up with this election. Um, I mean, I don't think there's been a, it, more Mexicans than there were two years ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. You know, it's just sort of a steady influx because there's a market for it, and the market kind of regulates that. If there's no not enough work, they just they just go somewhere else. I always uh, imagine there's just more pundits today, and that just makes it a bigger talking point. Yeah, yeah, I guess in part if you have to fill so much airtime, you you got to look for issues <laughs> like... Bill O'Reilly's uh, "Let's Have the War on Christmas" fight. Uh, oh yes, you know it's like what? <laughs> War on Christmas? Where is this? What could bringing biology to economics help in that regard? How could that? How could that change things for economics and economics in the public sphere, especially? Um, well, I, I guess just a more informed citizenry makes a better economy and democracy both. And you know, the point of science in all fields is that we're 
our decisions are based on better information. Now, I previously said we don't always make rational decisions. It's true. We make emotional decisions, but that doesn't mean we can't at least be informed. We know from uh, evolutionary studies that we prefer foods that are rich in fat and sugar because in our resource-poor Paleolithic environment, those kinds of foods were at once both really good for you and really scarce. We didn't evolve a mechanism in our brain to shut off and say, that's enough. In fact, it's, there's no saturation point. You just eat until you blow up. And uh, because you never know, you may not get that food again for another week or two, so you might as well stuff it down. Well, in the modern world, you know, of course, we can get it anytime we want. And but knowing that, you can say, okay, look, I'm, I'm going to put my food on a smaller plate. I'm going to cut it up into smaller bites. I'm going to eat slower. I'm going to chew more times. I'm going to, you know, avoid these kinds of foods and, and try to have only these kinds of food in the house. And, you know, that's a way of the the cortex overriding that emotional brain deep inside there that says more, more. <laughs> and so I like to think anyway, in a sort of my more optimistic moments, that uh, we, we are capable of overriding those deeper impulses. You spent some time around neuroscientists and going through their research about this. And what did you find as far as how the brain actually deals with these impulses and then how we try to fight them? New science of neuroeconomics, sometimes called neuromarketing, depending on what's actually being scanned, is really quite interesting. They're using these huge, uh, these MRI brain scanners, functional, because you're actually doing something when your brain is getting scanned. And all well, the brain scans are not scanning, they're not measuring uh, neural activity. They're measuring blood flow change in the brain. So the, the theory is that if you're thinking a lot about one thing and not another, this part of your brain is more active. As those neurons are firing, they're using more energy, so they need to draw more oxygen uh, to them from the blood, and so more blood flows in that, I to that area. So that's what's being measured is the blood flow. And the reason it is is because in your blood you have hemoglobin, and in the hemoglobin you have iron. Iron atoms are very heavy with a lot of electrons. The electrons are spinning on a, their little axis, and the magnets in these huge MRI machines are shifting back and forth. So they're shifting the polarity, causing the, the spin of the little electrons to flip. And it's, that's what's being measured, is the, how the little electrons in those atoms are, are changing. It, it, it almost gets down to quantum physics. It's a pure theoretical physics problem that got then applied to a, an actual medical procedure. And uh, so they measure the, the blood flow change, and then they show you stuff when you're in there. When you're crammed in there, you have these, um, a helmet on that measures your, all this stuff. You have these earphones so they can talk to you and also block out the horrendous sound. And then goggles. And the goggles have little TV monitors inside them, and you can see the computer screen that's on the outside of the, of the lab there in which they run these experiments. And they'll show you different things. Like, let's say they show you a Coke logo and a Pepsi logo. This was an actual experiment done. And it turns out the Coke logo uh, causes the areas of the brain that are rich in dopamine to light up a lot more than the Pepsi logo does. And dopamine-rich centers of the brain are associated with reward, with addictive drugs, with sex, with erotica, with any uh, looking at pleasant faces, thinking pleasant thoughts. Dopamine is like the reward drug, and for whatever reason, Coke has it, man. It's got the, the ultimate, uh, all-time greatest logo, <laughs> the red or the cursive uh, type or the fact that we've seen it a zillion times in our lives, I, I, I don't know. But this neural marketing idea is, oh, man, is this taken off because, of course, all these corporations want to know, all right, let's try six different logos and see which one causes the brain to light up. Well, I was reading about that effects of the Coke logo in your book, I was thinking this is something that so many Coke ad men have uh, tried so hard to get to happen over the decades, and here it is. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you can ask people what they like uh, is one thing, but um, actually measuring it, uh, that's another thing. And so neuromarketing has become kind of a hot new field for neuroscientists to get into and hire themselves out or rent their machines out doing that. And uh, of course, the implications are, well, back to my, you know, our, our discussion on uh, what's what's rational and free. I mean, are we really making rational choices when, in fact, these clever marketing guys have figured out certain things that can really tweak our brains, and you don't even really know it. It's happening. So it is a little, you know, in a way, disturbing, I suppose. You know, but hey, we live in a free society, so we don't want to, you know, just, like, block all advertising. I guess as a society, we decided we didn't want smoking cigarette ads. Okay, but we're not going to go for banning all, all advertising just because of that. So and knowing that, that it's there... Uh, at least in theory, I think, gives us an opportunity to override it. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Michael Shermer, founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and executive director of the Skeptics Society. His new book, The Mind of the Market, brings together economics and evolutionary biology. 
And you use a phrase in this book to make a little change of a subject, a phrase called virtue economics. And what is that? Well, uh, virtue economics, what I'm saying is that um, uh, whenever trade occurs between two strange individuals, uh, individuals that are strangers, uh, not related to one another, we don't know each other, you know, you're not one of my kin or kind, uh, how does that happen from an evolutionary perspective? How in the world can that happen? Because, you know, we can explain why we'd be nice and cooperative and pro-social and, and uh, with people that are genetically related to us, sacrificing myself helps get my genes into the next generation if you're related to me. Uh, and if I know you pretty well because we're part of the same group, uh, then we have a lot of interactions together and you're going to remember how I treated you. And so it pays for me selfishly to be nice and generous and cooperative because you'll remember that you'll be nicer to me and we'll have a reciprocal exchange. But that's all within group morality. What about between groups? Well, one of the things that trade does, and, and here I'm using the word rather loosely, and don't think of the economics as, as markets and money. Think of it as any social environment in which organisms are exchanging something. Now, chimp A grooms chimp B. Uh, there's a hygienic thing going on. You know, you pick off the fleas and ticks and all that. But there's something else going on, too. There's a kind of a bonding or attachment between those two chimps. And when one chimp gets um, attacked by an alpha male, the other one is more likely to come to his aid. So that grooming becomes a kind of uh, political alliance, a formation of a little faction that I'll take care of you if you take care of me. And literally, this is an I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. We call that reciprocal <laughs> altruism. And any kind of uh, reciprocal feasting between tribes, like the famous potlatch between Native American groups, Eskimo groups, and all that, they, that the reason for the potlatch or any kind of repetitive feasting and uh, swapping of food products between groups, that's a way of um, knocking back those natural tribal instincts to be xenophobic. And it, it really does reduce amount of intertribal violence. So my principle toward the end of the mind of the market is, is what I call Bastiat's principle, where goods do not cross frontiers, armies will. And uh, there I'm after something deeper here uh, at, the end of, at the end of the book that you know, free trade is a good thing. We should encourage that. Not, not just because we'll all get richer, that's one thing, but in a much deeper and more important level, it, it breaks down those natural animosities between groups. Trade, you think, might be a, necessarily a solution to war, but a big firewall against it. Human behavior in, in sociology, psychology, there are no laws, really. There's so many exceptions, right? But So we're looking for first approximation generalizations that lead us toward one thing rather than another thing. And if we get off the black and white thinking and into the probabilistic thinking, trade decreases the probabilities of war and increases the probabilities of more peaceful interactions. That's what I call the Starbuck, my Starbucks corollary to Bastiat's principle where Starbucks cross frontiers, armies won't. You know, it's not perfect. You know, it's uh, you know, it's, it's true. Sometimes two free market economies, uh, nations end up fighting each other, but rarely. So look what happens when when they do. Before they fight, uh, one of them usually declares an economic sanction against the other one. And what an economic sanctions do, like we have currently against uh, North Korea, Cuba, Iraq, and and on and off with other Middle Eastern countries, it's it's our way of saying if you don't change your behavior, we're not going to trade with you anymore. And, and everybody knows what that means. Like, uh-oh, that's a step in the direction toward possible invasion. And again, where goods cross frontiers, armies won't. And where they don't cross, armies sometimes do. So that, that's a principle. So the spread of liberal democracy and market capitalism in the long run attenuates the likelihood of war. I don't know how much you agree with Francis Fukuyama's idea about how we've settled on liberal democracy and free markets. And that's, that's the way things are going to, to end up. He's a little more deterministic than I am. I don't think it's inevitable. I think Jefferson was right, eternal vigilance. You have to fight for it. I mean, a long history of freedom. I'm not a big pro-war person, and neither as a libertarian am I, uh, you know, hands-off uh, non-interventionism in all areas, because in the history of humanity, liberty has almost always had to be fought for. Even, I mean, one of the classic exceptions of the generalization that two democracies don't fight one another is the American Civil War. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, two democracies going at it in a way. And, and uh, well, why is that? Well, um, you know, because sometimes there's other moral principles that are higher than trade and democracy. And that in this case, the fight was really over certain uh, liberties that, you know, one wanted to give and the other didn't. And, and so we ended up fighting about it. And unfortunately, inevitably, more liberties for more people are often had to have to be fought for. And 
So I, I think we have to we do have to keep that as an option. I'm not saying I support or don't support the war in Iraq, but as a general principle, you do often have to fight for it to get it. Now we can't be the world's police and go every single dictator to knock them down to create freedom for people. We don't have unlimited resources, but in, in, as a general principle, trying to set up democracies is a good thing. I don't think you can force people to do it, but if you can encourage them to do it, I think that's a good thing. And a lesson here is that free markets have to be maintained. They're not perfectly self-sustaining? Yes, they require, you know, vigilant effort to maintain. I mean, that's why, well, that's why our, our elections are always so contentious. We're constantly fighting over just how much individual liberty we want to allow our citizens to have and how much intervention into that should the government have from the top down. Now, one of the things that I talk about in the mind of the market is that our folk economics uh, inclines us to distrust big, complex systems. And so this is what fuels conspiracy theories, for example. And, Back you know, to Oh, Stone. the economy, that's actually controlled by, you know, 12 guys in London, the Bilderbergers, <laughs> and the Illuminati, or the Rockefellers, or the Rothschilds, you know. Um, because the idea of this big, chaotic system just being self-organized from the bottom up is quite counterintuitive. It's the same problem a lot of people have with evolution. I mean, come on, are you telling me that whole thing came about from... the you know, just the forces of nature, now nah, it looks designed from the top down. <laughs> you know, that's the whole intelligent design business and why it, it does, did so well uh, as a concept because our brains are very uh, conducive to a top-down explanation. Mind of the market, in part, is a uh, argument for just letting the system go and on its own it, it self-organizes into reasonably, reasonably well-oiled uh, exchanges between people that generates this complex economy. Put out there the concept of, not, maybe not in so many words, but the concept of the both biological creationist, which we, we all know, and then there's also the economic creationist. And the funny thing is that a lot of the biological non-creationists I know also happen to be economic creationists, and it seems like a, a bit of a contradiction. <clears throat> yep. Um, well, that gets back to that, uh, how we were uncomfortable with using... Uh, Darwinian thinking about human nature because of that whole social Darwinism business. And yeah, so I, I would agree with that. <laughs> now, what is the, it's become kind of trendy now to, to reference this field, but the, the field of happiness research, what has that told us about economics? Oh, yeah, I had to, I had to write a chapter on happiness because of the, you know, the classic belief that if I made more money, I'd be happier. And well, that's a, that's a testable hypothesis and it's been tested countless times and it's failed the test. And once you're above the poverty line, yes, of course, uh, you don't have a roof over your head and three square meals a day and just, you know, basic human needs met. Not happy till you get to that. But it's above that. I think in today's level, it's something like $20,000 a year. And making more money doesn't make you any more happy. Part of the reason is because temperament, that is how good you feel, you know, on any given day, is 50% genetically programmed. So people are just happy and some people are just not happy no matter what the circumstances and well, that means the other half is that, you know, at my, my control, I can pick environments that are more likely to make me happy or whatever. And it turns out that making more money isn't one of the variables. The four big variables are having a family or just being in love or having, having a significant relationship with somebody else. And then, two, having a, a social circle, friends, community that you like to do stuff with. Three is meaningful work and purpose. In life, that's some, you know, something that sort of takes you out of your little immediate circle in, in self and, and work on something, whether it's just your job or you know, working for something uh, nonprofit or whatever. And then finally, four is this nebulous religiosity or spirituality. Uh, humans have a need to, um, to, to transcend the here and now, the physical body, and, and just be in awe of something else, whether it's uh, God or gods or the great spirit in the sky or the cosmos or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Whole idea is to take you out of yourself and have and some some kind of time alone each you know, week or month or whatever that you can kind of contemplate all that and that that giving people the freedom to have that and those four things together seems to most affect happiness as well as health and longevity too. That takes us back to our evolutionary history. I mean, what are we? We're a social primate species and we have to hang together so we don't hang separately, as the, as Franklin said, and and so social. Groups, trust, interactions, friendship, marriage, or you know, bonding of any kind, deeply meaningful to us. Now, how does this book, The Mind of the Market, fit into your whole body of work? You've called someone who works with, who, who examines poorly substantiated beliefs, and we can see that with the folk economics and folk science you cover here, but what made it time for you to write a book on economics? 
Uh, well, each of my books is kind of an extension of the last book I wrote. And so my last book in this series was The Science of Good and Evil, in which I talk about our evolved moral sentiments and how we have a, a deep moral sense uh, about what's right and wrong. And you know, I gave you an example of that with the unfair offer. Another example is called the trolley car problem, where there's a trolley car hurtling down a uh, railroad track and you're standing there at the split in the track where there's a switch and the, tra and the train's about to go down the, the one track and kill five workers unless you throw the switch and then the train goes down the other track and kills one worker. Should you throw the switch? Well, this is a thought experiment that tens of thousands of people have taken. It. And then there's other scenarios that sort of spin off of that. One of them is that the, 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 the trolley is hurtling down the track and it's about to kill five workers. There's no split in the track. It's just going to kill the five workers. And you're standing on a bridge over the track. Standing next to you is a great big guy. And if you throw him off, heave him off the bridge, he lands on the track, stops the trolley, it kills him, but it saves the five workers. Should you throw the guy off the bridge? Almost everybody says, well, no, I, I couldn't do that. Well, why not? It's the same moral calculation, kill one to save five. And the reasons people give are interesting. They, you know, they have this kind of visceral sense that, it just doesn't feel right. I mean, to actually physically throw somebody feels like I'm killing them versus throwing the switch, which is more like, well, the train's killing them. I'm just throwing the switch. So that's that difference between direct and indirect action and physical contact versus uh, distance. And, and that, that's tapping something deeper in our evolutionary past and how deeply wedded we are to other members of our group. And I think we've been on a long trajectory for the last 5,000 years of counting more and more people as members of our in-group. And, uh, you know, Old Testament morality, love thy neighbor as thyself, in the, in the earliest books of the Old Testament, that really meant your, your neighbor was your fellow in-group member, which, which it goes a long ways to explaining sort of paradoxical nature of the Old Testament. On one page, you're reading these wonderful moral homilies, love thy neighbor as thyself. On the next page, you're instructed by Yahweh to go rape, kill, and pillage, and destroy all these uh, pe bad people on the other side of the river. Yeah, I wonder Why? about that. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because that's that, that's not our tribe. That those are those are strangers. They're not part of us. And okay, well that's just good old tribalism. But then by the end of the Old Testament, with the Book of Ruth and the sort of feminization of Yahweh and introduction of Jesus is uh, turn the other cheek um, and and more uh, more inclusiveness. That is, you're supposed to treat strangers from other groups like you would treat your own fellow group members. And that's that's that sort of expansion of who we count, who we constitute as a fellow in-group member. And I'm encouraged, I mean, if you look at the last 500 years, say, of how many more people are counted as members of the in-group. Now, you know, blacks and women. <laughs> and eventually, I think we're getting there with gays and <clears throat> maybe in Southern California and Mexicans. And we have more and more inclusiveness. But again, I hate to say it, but you, it's one of those things you have to fight for. Because the natural propensity we have is to circle the wagons and protect our tribe. Could we potentially make the world one big in-group with advances in, for example, communication, information technology? Could the world be our in-group? I think the Internet has the best chance of doing that um, for us uh, ever because, um, and I call this my Google theory of peace, that is where information is free to cross frontiers, then armies won't. And, I mean, the best thing that could happen for China, for us, from the world's perspective, and the individual Chinese citizens' perspective, everybody's perspective but the, the rulers, <laughs> is uh, let Google in there. Let, let every single Chinese person have a laptop and, and Internet access, and that's the end of the dictatorship. <laughs> you can't, if you can't control information, you can't control the people. And so in the long history of dictatorships and fascistic governments, information control is everything, and that's why propaganda through the media is so, so important to control for a dictator. Well, you can't do that on the Internet. You simply can't. There's, in theory, an infinite number of channels, just, you know, bloggers and all those MySpace and YouTubes and LinkedIn and all the social networking and just individual bloggers, millions of bloggers now. And uh, information wants out. It wants freedom. And uh, just like people want to be free and products want to be free, and we all want to have free access. And it's, so I, in the long run, I think we have seen the end of dictatorships, not inevitably, but thanks to the World Wide Web. Now, what made it a mission of yours to explode weird beliefs? Oh, well, I guess, <laughs> I guess in general, um, you know, I've always been pro-science and you know, I'm a scientist. And our belief is that we can make rational decisions based on scientific evidence. I mean, one of the things that uh, writing The Mind of the Market 
has shown me is that, boy, we really are not very rational. But all the more reason we should, you know, work at it because we really do have huge brains. Our cortex, prefrontal cortex and cortex compared to even chimps or gorillas, just gigantic. So there is something there to work with. <laughs> And uh, But we have to set up lots of rules, like I have a teenager now, she's 16, and, and learning to drive, and uh, boy, you know, their brains are just really not quite ready for complex <laughs> tests that like that, and that's why the state of California has passed these laws about, you know, the restrictions on that. There's a reason for that. Uh, those their, their cortexes, their frontal cortexes are not quite ready for, you know, contemplating long-term consequences of, of their behavior, and so we have to structure society to, you know, really work around that. I remember I just had trouble knowing which way to push the turn indicator to turn left or right, up, down. I, I couldn't even get that down. And you and I, uh, you know, we, we didn't have nearly as much stuff to do in the car with, you know, iPods and your BlackBerry and your cell phone and satellite radio with a zillion choices. And yeah, there's just too much. So I think Arnold made a good decision there to sort of ram through that law about uh, no cell phone talking by teenagers and can't drive around with your friends until you're a certain age. You know, because they all distract each other. I've <laughs> in the car with my daughter and her friends, and they're all just yakking it up, laughing, and you know, before you know it, the, you're not you're not really paying attention. One of the pieces of biographical information that circulates about you was that you're you're uniquely well placed to be a public skeptic because you yourself believed all the whole book of weird things at some point. And is that true? Um, well, it is in a sense. I mean, I'm not I'm I'm not immune to the temptation of wishing these things, some of these things were true. I, I do hope there's extraterrestrial intelligences out there somewhere. It'd be sort of a tragic waste of space, as Carl Sagan liked to say, if we were alone in the universe. But that's a different question from have they come here. But the reason UFOs and alien abductions is such a fascinating subject to me, because it does really tap into the fact that people do care about that. Like, wow, I mean, if we're not alone, what are the implications for theology and philosophy and the meaning of life and all that? So I, I enjoy the process, even though I don't believe there's a shred of evidence that UFOs have come here. And that's true, too, I think, with, like, paranormal stuff. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could actually control things with your mind? And I think I'm, I'm probably with my friend Christopher Hitchens on this one. I wouldn't want people to be able to read my mind. <laughs> of course, he put it in this context of you wouldn't want God, a God to be able to read your mind. It'd be like living in North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want people to know what I'm thinking. But, but it would be interesting if you could actually control something just by thinking about it and of course, we're getting close to the technology of that now. Actually, we're not getting close. We're there. I mean, you know, those those um, experiments with paralyzed people where they put a chip in their brain and train them to think about moving a cursor on a computer screen, and the chip picks up that neural activity and sends a radio signal to the computer, and it moves the cursor across the screen. There's that guy, I forget his name, who does email just by thinking about it. He just moves, thinks about a thought, moves the cursor, and his brain has learned that. Now, if you didn't know he had a chip in his brain, you'd think, this guy's got telekinesis. He can move a cursor in a computer. Well, eventually you could, you know, like have a chip in there that turns your stereo on when you come home and you, know, you walk in the house and think Mozart, and boom, Mozart comes on. Oh, wow. <laughs> but you see, that that's what I mean when I say there's no such thing really as the paranormal. There's just the normal and all the stuff we have yet to explain. And, you know, once you know the chip is in the brain, the explanation is there. So if it turns out that people could actually read each other's mind through some sort of weird quantum physics spooky action at a distance sort of thing that some people think. If that turned out to be true, that would no longer be part of the paranormal. That would just be whatever, psychophysics or something. Now, I wanted to ask as well, what is your own background as far as economic beliefs? You discuss this a little in the book, like I believe you mentioned having a, I don't know if it still lasts, but a bit of a, a love affair with objectivism at one point. Oh, yes, I did, and I'm still a libertarian, uh, probably, I guess, small L libertarian, the distinction being do you vote libertarian, big L, or or just have libertarian leanings that is fiscal, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Uh, that's me. There's different kinds of libertarians. There's some that like it just because they want to smoke pot or whatever and not have consequences to their <laughs> their individual actions. And, uh, okay, that's one branch. But there's more of us are uh, toward the sort of Ron Paul, um, we should have less government in all areas of life. Now, I think Ron goes a little far on certain things about the war, for example. But in foreign policy. I mean, he has a non-interventionism anywhere, anytime, uh, under any circumstances. Well, that that can't be right. Uh, I mean, the history of freedom is you do have to fight for it. So we can't have a complete non-intervention policy. But as a general principle, yes, he was. he's known as Dr. No. He's a physician. You know, He just says no to everything because <laughs> when the governments do something, you know, inevitably they're doing something to 
that either costs a lot of money or removes freedom. And so uh, us libertarians tend to say, wait, let's put the brakes on here and stop all this uh, intervention and only do it when necessary. You're past the time when you think that uh, Ayn Rand has the answers then. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, when you're young, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was in college, and, you know, that's typically where most people read it, and pretty impressionable. And, you know, she's a powerful figure, personality-wise, a brilliant woman, and and a great thinker, and so yeah, of course it seemed right. Now, obviously, the you know the movement itself got too attached to her. Any time a movement gets attached to a personality, that's not a good thing. I mean, principles and ideas should stand on their own, regardless of the person. So whether you're a Darwinian or neo-Darwinian, uh, forget it. Those are not even the right. Just leave Darwin out of it. Just what's actually true in nature? That's the only thing we care about. And focus on the facts. Yeah, focus on the facts. Most scientists don't. I mean, we're people too, right? So we. We cling to our groups, and we have our alpha males, right? So we like Einstein and Darwin, and, Newton, and we call it Newtonian mechanics or whatever. That's just a shortcut. Um, really, it's just the mathematics behind it that we care about. And so we do have to be careful with that. I mean, in, in, when you get into, like, the social sciences, you're a behaviorist, and a Skinnerian, ooh, ooh, or you're a, um, you know, a Randian objectivist, or you, or you believe in the Austrian school of ec- free market economics at the Sh- University of Chicago school, and there, there's a little bit to it much attachment to an idea of like a place or a person and that that smacks a little bit of cultishness and that i don't i think it's always wise to avoid that there's a danger then of using your intelligence to justify what you already have attached yourself to that's right confirmation bias we look for and find confirmatory evidence for what we already believe and and just ignore the disconfirmatory evidence everybody does it but in science the self-correcting mechanism requires you to try to find your own disconfirmatory evidence, because if you don't, somebody else will, usually with great glee in a published <laughs> forum, <laughs> and uh, try to really expose you. And, uh, whoa, that's, Feynman used to say this, you know, the first rule is that uh, we should not fool ourselves, and we are the easiest persons, people to fool. Ourselves are the easiest people to fool. So self-deception is a powerful thing, and so that's why it's always a good idea to walk down the hall and and throw an idea by your colleague before you put it in print. Hey, Bob, I had this wild idea, and uh, it's probably crazy. And I'm no, you're the guy who can show me where it's wrong, you know. And, yeah, and, exactly. And if he's honest, you know, or she's honest, she'll tell you. And that's a good thing. Before you, you know, hold the press conference and say, I've discovered, uh, you know, energy too cheap to meter. Well, wait. <laughs> you know, you and a thousand other people lined up out the patent office. Uh, the physics tells us that's probably not possible. Now, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you one more thing, and it's because it's something I know you've done, and I just wanted to get an idea of the experience. What is it like to debate a creationist? Oh, I've done it quite a bit, and if you're, um, you know, I think if you're respectful and honest and not nasty, uh, you know, it's, it can be an enlivening experience. I mean, for me, I'm always collecting data on, on, why, on belief systems, why, why people believe what they believe, and so I'm always curious, you know, do these Holocaust deniers or the creationists or the 9-11 conspiracy people, do they actually believe these things? Well, yeah, they do. Why? Why do they believe that? How'd they get there? And so listening to their arguments and then talking to them afterwards, especially talking to them afterwards, especially over like beer and pizza, oh. where they kind of loosen up <laughs> and they tell you what they're really thinking. You know, you find out that, like in the case of the creationists, inevitably they have a background in which they're, you know, they're born-again Christians. And all of these these clever arguments are are means of reinforcing what they already believe. In other words, these are reasons to believe if you... These are good arguments if you already believe and you think that God acts in the world on a fairly regular basis, then you can go ahead and think that, you know, the eye was you know, created by God or DNA or whatever, <clears throat> and that just reinforces. If you think scientists can't explain it yet, then the idea that your God did it, you know, kind of feels good. It reinforces what you believe. The book, once again, is The Mind of the Market, Compassionate Apes, Competitive Humans, and Other Tales from Evolutionary Economics. Michael Shermer, thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com. <laughs>